Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Jake, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Kip. Today, we're going back to the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report to see what else we could learn from it. Yeah, you know, as we wrapped up the previous episode on it, I was thinking, geez, there's just so much more here to consider. So, yeah, one episode was not enough. Uh, Definitely not. And uh, so let's just dive right in. I'm going to give a quick overview of what we plan to discuss today with the... uh, The eternal caveat that just because we think or say we're going to talk about it doesn't mean we'll actually get to it. Oh, come on. We're a little bit better than that. Well, you know, (laughs) you never know. We we never know exactly where things will take us. True, true, Um, true that. But here is the plan. So first, we're going to look at the industry breakouts and the patterns available from that particular analysis in the report. Um, Second... We're going to investigate a little more deep into something that's very important to both of us, which is the uh, differences between large and small businesses. Um, and you know, I have to I have to admit, I'll give a little bit of a uh, of a uh, of a preview right now. It was not as exciting as I was as I was thinking it might be, but the lessons from it are probably actually more important than I realized. So I'll wow, leave that what as a, a, tease. What a what teaser, a tease. right? <laughs> and then last, last, we're going to look at some specific trends. Um, and actually, we're going to focus on one question you you had mentioned to me um, a couple days after the previous uh, recording. You said, hey, Jake, I heard a rumor about security incident event management systems and how much they're catching. And so we're going to talk about that too. So how's that for a tease? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, everybody, uh, there you go. That's our three-point plan for this episode. And let's see if we can do it within a reasonable amount of time. All right, let's dive in and let's start with the industry breakouts. So, all right, look, here's the thing about uh, the report in general. And this is a caveat that they state very clearly in there, but I'm going to restate it. There are a lot of raw numbers in there. And um, and you might be tempted to compare, you know, the, the number of incidents and the number of breaches in one industry to another. And you might be tempted to say, you know, oh, construction is in good shape overall because they have very, very few incidents and breaches compared to, oh, I don't know, say professional services, which is actually at the top of the list on a raw, you know, count basis. But don't do that. Um, there's a lot of of reasons why that would uh, create some false uh, conclusions. And a lot of it has to do with the reporting process, which is to say that maybe maybe the people in construction just don't don't tell people much about their incidents and breaches. They're not a chatty bunch, but professional services people like Jake and I, who can't stop talking, tell everybody. So so bear that in mind. We're going to bear that in mind, too, as we as we go through here. Um, But at the same time, uh, because some industries have higher numbers, you can say more interesting things about them because the data sets are larger and you can do more analysis. So um, so that's why they get the white hot spotlight on them. So I hope that makes sense. Um, And so having said that, um, let's keep going, Jake. Uh, yeah, it does make sense. It makes a lot of sense. So, so I want to actually start by mentioning some of the industries that we are not going to talk about, uh, and it's because there isn't a lot of available data. So, first of all, a bit of context: in 2019, Verizon collected 157,525 incidents, of which 108,069 were breaches. Um, however, the vast majority of those were either not interesting because they were just, you know, individual credential based attacks, like to log into a bank account or something, or they weren't reliable. And so the DBIR covers 32,002 total incidents that converted to 3,950 actual breaches. And okay, just so- as a just as a, yeah. just as a reminder, a breach is an incident where there is confirmed disclosure. So there's a you know this is a very specific. I, th- this is variety. This is the DBIR specific definition. Um, 
people should not mistake the Verizon definition for a legal definition. Uh, just because something under, under most, particularly under most modified data breach statutes these days, um, you know, there are many of these incidents would qualify as quote breaches um, under the law, whereas for technical purposes and, and analytical purposes, they do not for Verizon right. the DBIR. So yeah, so the DBIR is a technical report, not a not a legal analysis. Correct. Correct. Okay. So um, okay, here are the uh, NAICS. Um, codes or industries that we're not discussing. And again, the reason is, is that all of these have under 50 incidents, in some cases under 30 incidents, and then less than 30 breaches. Um, and those are administrative, construction, management, mining, and trade. Um, the ones that we are going to talk about, and, and we'll give a list here in a moment, they, they involve thousands of incidents and hundreds of breaches. Yeah. And so there's a lot of data reduction here, right? So Verizon collected almost 158,000 incidents, but a very, only a small section of it, 32,000 were actually analyzed. So um, again, another, uh, another thing to bear in mind as you, as you read the report is the vast majority of incidents were not deeply analyzed because of data quality issues. But, um, and, and so that's another point here, which is, you know, about 7,000 incidents couldn't even be categorized into NAICS industry codes. So, um, so that skews the data uh, a little bit as well. But um, anyway, so again, more caveats, but who, okay, Jake, who are we going to look at? Okay, so well, there are many different ways we could have diced this up, but I'm just going to go with the top five industry codes by number of incidents. And as Kip just mentioned, unknown would count. Uh, in fact, it would be second place. Um, but Obviously, we're going to ignore that since we can't say that much about the the unknown categories. So we've got um, we got professional services, public sector, um, information technology, and the information kind of industry, and then finance and manufacturing. And then I tossed it in as a bonus education. Um, we're definitely going to talk about professional services and the information sector, uh, and mostly leave the rest uh, undiscussed. We're skipping public sector just because. We don't have public sector clients. However, the analysis that we go through for all of these is um, is really valuable, and it and it would apply anyway. So you know, just because we're not going to be talking about your specific sector, um, you know, don't go away, don't change that <laughs> dial, uh, as they used to say on the radio, and uh, and uh, trust me, I think you'll get something out of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Because I think there's some there's some themes and just kind of the way we break it down would be helpful to you. So so let's get going. Um, We're going to start with, um, again, this professional services and it and its industry is actually professional, scientific and technical services. And many of our of our clients and our peers fall into that category. This is the industry that we operate in. And um, and so uh, it's it's really typical for. Uh, organizations in this industry to have a some kind of a web presence, you know, to either just say, hey, we're open, we're available to help you, or maybe they're doing content based marketing, or they're doing file upload, file download, right file sharing data sharing anyway. um, And so, you know, the the, um, the need for a for a good web presence of some kind is really important to organizations in here. And, and I think that's going to be true really for a lot of other industries if they're not already doing it now uh, because we're living in the age of lockdowns, quarantines, working from home, that sort of thing. But anyway, that's a little forward looking. Okay, but here's some of the interesting takeaways. So in this industry, the vast majority of the attacks were financially motivated. 93%, in fact, uh, were able to be categorized as financially motivated. Now, there's other types of motivations, right? You might be a hacktivist. You've got a political agenda and you're using, um, you know, computer attacks as a means of pursuing your agenda, um, you know, espionage, that sort of thing. But, but that's not what this industry is facing. It's, it's really finance. It's finance driven. It is. I I do. It it is probably worthwhile to point out that actually um, espionage itself is the second highest actor motive. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's in there, but it's just, it's not number one. Um, And so that just, again, just sort of Jake, you know, really makes the point that 
there's only so much we can cover in this episode. So um, hopefully we're going to motivate you to get back into the report and really drill down into your industry and just don't even bother looking at the other ones. Just really, really get familiar with what are the issues in your industry. It's going to help you. And we're going to tell you how uh, towards the end of the episode. Um, and so no surprise for this industry, the number one attack pattern is web application compromise and um and also phishing and uh either lost or stolen credentials are playing a uh, an outsized role in the successful breaches of these organizations and their websites um and in, and also interesting 22 percent of the attacks involve insider threats so um okay so that's kind of the you know the the overview but you know jake why 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 is this the top um you know why is this the industry with the most incidents so um three words here kip location 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 uh, <laughs> you, you should have been a realtor <laughs> i know right the uh the professional industry uh you know holds a ton of valuable personal information you know this is not um this is not the industry where bad guys go to get credit card numbers right this is this is the home of lawyers like me, accountants, scientists, engineering firms, and they uh, the hackers here want personal data that can be sold and later used in various kinds of financial fraud. Um, and you know, real fast, I'm, I'm gonna I'm see. I knew this would happen. I'm already gonna go slightly off script here. Um, I just wanted to just wanted to point out that that you know the patterns that we talk about here they're defined. Um, in on page pages thirty six and thirty seven, mostly uh, of the DBIR, and it is worth understanding um, very quickly what what they mean by web application as the kind of number one attack pattern. And I'll just read it because it's really short. Incidents in this pattern include anything that has a web application as the target. This includes attacks against the code of the actual web application, such as exploiting code base vulnerabilities, which is considered a hacking exploit vuln um, in terms of the attack variety, um, two attacks against authentication, which is uh, use of stolen credentials, for example. So, you know, I think that it's it's useful to dig in and understand not just kind of at a high level, but also to dig in and, and really figure out what is Verizon saying here um, in, you know, in terms of these patterns. So, so going back to our, 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 our industry professionals here, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because the, uh, the, the second place kind of, uh, set of patterns here is, is what the DBIR in this case unhelpfully lumps together as everything else. And, you know, there's a reason they have to do that is that it's actually very difficult to classify some of these things. Um, and, you know, I think it's worthwhile to mention a a very common one that we have talked about many times before, which is the business email compromise. Um, If you want to just give a a 30 second kind of uh, reminder of what that is. It's fancy fishing. There you go. I did it in less than 30 seconds. That's impressive. You did like two words. (laughs) Now I assume that, I assume that, that you're spelling fancy with pH, right? Of course. Did you hear it? I did. I did hear it. That's why I asked. Um, So so yeah, so the, the it's targeted, right? I'm per, I'm I'm impersonating somebody, yes, and and uh, and maybe I've broken in and taken over an account to do that. I've seen that happen, or maybe I've just set up a uh, a lookalike domain and and I'm sending you messages from a lookalike domain. These are very difficult to to detect. Um, we're getting better at detecting them, but they're very difficult to detect, and um, uh, and they can lead to huge payoffs. Yep. And just a, just when we say lookalike domain, I just want to give a really quick example. So Kip, actually your domain itself would be a prime um, target because it's very long. Cyberriskopportunities.com. Right. Um, you know, I can tell you that when I type it, I don't always type it quite right. And so mm-hmm. if someone, you know, registered cyber risk opportunities and, and misplaced and, you know, forgot an I or added an extra I somewhere in there. Or an it, extra R. Or an yeah. extra R. It'd be hard to see potentially, right? Like, I mean, it, it's yeah. not going to be an automatic, oh, that's so obvious. So mm-hmm. that's what we mean by by kind of, um, you know, a, a domain that's, that's uh it's fake. Yeah, at a glance, it it looks indistinguishable from the true one. Yep. So uh, now here's something that's really interesting, and I would say distressing in a way about the professional industry, and um, it's it's a question of uh, submit rate 
to phishing attacks and and you know ways to get credentials. And the so good news is that you know the vast majority of companies involved in these incidents have a zero percent submit rate, meaning that their employees are not giving away credentials, which is great. Um, however, just a little bit fewer have a, also have a report rate of zero percent, and that's terrible. That's terrible because over the course of this industry group, far too many employees are doing something um, that maybe they shouldn't have and keeping quiet about it. So, you know, if you don't tell security about an incident, they can't engage the incident response plan. And that is bad. And uh, before I turn it back over to you, Kip, I just wanted to mention, I think this this one is particularly striking to me, is that there were about 7,500 incidents, but only only 326 actual breaches. So, you know, again, we're not able to take a great deal of, of, of takeaways, you know, from just the raw numbers. But I do think it's worthwhile to point out that, um, you know, we are talking about, uh, you know, still hundreds of breaches, uh, right. But a much, much larger number of incidents. So, yeah. And, um, and I think this is, uh, gets back to a theme that we brought up in the beginning, which is, um, this is, this is data that is, um, inherently biased and a lot of times it's biased through, uh, you know, reporting bias, which is to say that, um, especially like we talked about how construction, for example, as an industry doesn't have very many incidents on records, on the record here, and it doesn't have very many breaches. That doesn't automatically mean that they're not attacked very much and that they don't suffer. It could and probably does mean that they don't tell people about it due to shame or due to, uh, fear of, you know, of, of bad consequences by speaking up and saying something. And I think that, you know, that's still present even in the industries where there's a lot of reporting of the incidents. Um, you know, you, you can report an incident and still bury the idea that there was a data breach or a consequence. Okay, so let's unpack that for a moment. So why would people, you know, be, uh, you know, not be reporting this stuff? And but typically, it's a, it's a culture issue. Um, if you work or operate in a culture where uh, telling uncomfortable truths is punished, right? Messengers are punished. You're, you're not going to be likely to say anything. Um, uh, and um, and also because, you know, sort of in a way by telling people that there has been a, an incident or, or certainly if, if there's been a breach, well, my goodness, that's going to ruin my day because like I have this huge list of things to get done. And if I tell somebody that there's actually been a breach, well, then I'm going to be stuck in meetings for the rest of the day trying to explain this stuff. And this little thing is going to follow me around like a little black cloud for days or weeks. And, and you know, nobody wants that. I mean, they just don't want that. And so there's a lot of resistance to um, voluntarily putting yourself into that situation. And I think that's why a lot of crimes don't get reported at all. So anyway, um, so I think just to summarize, there's some cultural barriers. And so if you're a if you're a senior decision maker or if you have any influence as a leader in your organization, um, really be thinking about how can we make reporting incidents and data breaches um, uh, easier and, and, you know, to have less bad consequences for the reporters. That's right. And I think it's worth pointing out that if if. If you're if you get into litigation over a data breach and you know a root cause analysis gets performed and you know litigation is where people dig deep and and your opponent finds you know finds that it was the culture that prevented reporting you know I don't think it's I don't I don't think this has been litigated at all yet but I certainly would would argue that um, cultural prevention of reporting is not reasonable cybersecurity. So, no. so uh, there <laughs> right. you go. It, it isn't. I, no, I, I don't think it's reasonable. And management is responsible for setting the cultural tenants and for shaping and molding them. And it's incredibly difficult um, to change an organization's culture. I know I've been there. I've attempted it. It's super difficult. Sometimes it's impossible. Um, and I know stories about entrepreneurs that started companies and then either blew them up or sold them off because the cultures that created were, uh, were allowed to develop organically and haphazardly and were, um, were toxic. If you read Tony Shea's book, 
um, about uh, his entrepreneurial journey. Um, he, he, he talks a lot about that in there. So it's really, it's management, right? And yep. it's management's responsibility. So if, to the extent that they get that wrong, um, yeah, that's not reasonable. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts on professionals? Uh, well, we are a, uh, we're, we are a chatty bunch, I guess. <laughs> we are. And, and we have lots of things that people, that bad guys want. So, uh, we, we better, you know, get, we better get better. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So now the next one on the list is public sector. Um, but we're, again, we're, we're not really going to dive into that. If you're working in the public sector though, um, you know, just listen again to what we did to the professional services sector, how we kind of broke that down. Um, and, uh, you know, and do that for yourself. Um, and we're going to also, but we are going to, you know, look at, um, uh, at another section, which is IT services. So that's going to be, uh, well, information. And it includes IT services, cloud services, and uh, managed service providers, you know, what we would call the tech industry in large. And what do you know? Web application attacks uh, accounts for almost 40% of the total breaches, which, you know, kind of uh, emulates the professional services industry a bit. Um, and... Another fascinating aspect is that this category of web application attacks is closest to, I think, what people talk about as real hacking, you know, in the, in the media and, um, and in the entertainment industry, movies, television, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's enabled a great deal by the use of stolen credentials, you know, um, the old trope of having your, um, your password written down on the underside of your keyboard or something like that. But these days you don't even have to step foot into an organization. The uh, internet is uh, absolutely swimming in an ocean of compromised credentials. And, um, you know, the, the cyber attackers, the adversary uh, absolutely is tapping into that and is rapid firing those credentials into our uh, web applications, into our remote desktop servers are VPN servers and uh, and they're having a heyday but the second most large uh, second largest pattern is errors and so errors that, you mean like yeah. oopsies yeah mistakes and you know what that lines up really well with the dominant uh, narrative in the media right now about cloud data breaches and um, and how a lot of sensitive data is being disclosed over the internet simply because the data was not sufficiently secure. Um, they didn't get the permissions correct or they created a data share or a database and they deliberately tore down uh, the permissions because they didn't want to deal with it. And so, um, you know, I would call that an error because I doubt very seriously that that company's security policy would, you know, would recommend that for ease of use, one should remove all permissions. Definitely not. <laughs> um, and so, you know, what do you, what do you do about errors? Well, um, you know, you have to have good policies and procedures. People need to know what's expected um, redundancy would be helpful, right? So, um, having somebody who does it a lot and is very good at it and can explain to other people, you know, um, Hey, these permissions look like a pain in the butt, but actually they're not all that tough. Let me show you how you do this. And I think automation is really important here. Um, there's a new kind of a newish idea about infrastructure as code where you can build, um, virtual environments in AWS, Google cloud, Azure and other places, not by manually going in and, and creating virtual machines, you know, by typing on a keyboard and doing everything uh, custom built as we used to do, but by actually writing a script to, uh, to have all this stuff created for you and putting in the script all of the correct security settings to include permissions, the right permissions. And, um, and I think that kind of automation is fantastic because, um, it's really going to give you a much more uh, reliable uh, default set of of security settings. That's right. It definitely will. Um, so you know, I think that I think that the 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 patterns here, particularly the one about the miscellaneous errors, I, I think it's a really good argument for robust policies, procedures, and redundancy. And the reason is that. You know, if, um, for example, the the business email compromise that we talked about, uh, 
you know, oftentimes it includes uh, wiring money someplace else. And, you know, you could, you could, you could conceive of, of ways to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, quote, securing your system against receiving emails that are, that might be, you know, that might be phishing uh, intended for the business email compromise. But you could also spend 15 minutes making a decision that you're not go- that your company is just not going to do wires without at least two people signing off and your potential safety uh, has just gone up dramatically and you've spent next to nothing. Um, and I think with errors, you know, it's probably not that simple, but if you have well-documented standard operating procedures and policies and procedures regarding how to, you know, spin up cloud storage buckets, then your then, you know, one, the, the risk that someone's just going to do it is lower because most people don't want to break the rules. Um, you know, obviously we have that, you know, 20 percent ish of, uh, of insider threats. But but if we're you know just normal people are not trying to break rules and then and then if someone does, uh, there's consequence. Yeah. Well, you know, errors. Right. Let's think about it. So there's a whole category of insurance policy that you can purchase and that most organizations have. And it's called errors and omissions. Yep. You and know. It, it's guard. It's it's designed to guard against exactly this sort of thing. And um, and guess what? This is another management issue. If employees, uh, staff, contractors, outsourcers are making errors, it suggests that they are uh, not trained properly or are being put under too much pressure to deliver results. And so are cutting corners like crazy. And all that stuff is uh, falls into the lap of management to deal with. It, it absolutely does, and um, I, I think that you know we could we could probably continue to talk about this for for quite a while, but we're already at twenty six minutes. So, um, <laughs> at the risk of wanting to do a third episode, don't worry, we won't do it. Um, let's skip to that most ancient of questions, Kip. Does <laughs> size matter? Why are you laughing? Well, what's what's well funny about done. that? Well oh, done. Yeah. Right. It is an ancient question. It's also a giggly one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but let's stick with the DBIR and size for the purposes of this analysis uh, is kind of, um, uh, well, there's not a lot of granularity here. Uh, you're either a small business, which means you have less than a thousand employees, or you're a large business, which means you have more than that. And um, that just you know the image that I come that I get in my mind immediately is this pyramid where the line between a small and a large business is drawn way way up high because the vast majority of organizations don't have a uh, thousand employees so uh, so so that that's pretty interesting but um, anyway so. That's kind of what they say by size, but that's not really helpful for us, right? Because we we work in the uh, under one thousand employee uh, space quite a bit. Jake and I do. sometimes so, under three hundred or under. I mean, definitely under five hundred. Yeah, well, I'm working with some startups that are under you know uh, twenty. Yep. Um, but you know, so even with that, you know, I think there's a couple of reasons they did this. First, uh, the the DBIR hasn't included a dedicated discussion. Uh, about size since 2013. And that actually creates a little bit of an issue because uh, those patterns that we talked about, you know, the everything else, web applications, point of sale, privilege misuse, miscellaneous errors, they didn't exist. Um, they hadn't been invented yet in 2013. Um, but we can still get some interesting facts. And I think some of them are, are, are interesting. So first we have the obvious huge disparity in numbers. So this year's report includes 407 incidents uh, encompassing 221 breaches for the small businesses and 8,666 incidents with 576 breaches for the large ones. Now, again, we got a caveat, you know, with the numbers and what you can say, and it is skewed. There's obviously reporting bias. Um, and the DBIR folks, you know, they ask the question, you know, is this simply a case of mo money, mo problems? Um, or are, or is it you know a case of more nuanced factors like larger organizations having larger attack surfaces, um, increased visibility, or is it that smaller businesses aren't as good at discovery? Yeah, and, the, uh, you know they might be ignoring stuff or just reporting it because it's not convenient. They're not obligated to. They're not publicly traded. You know they're not regulated. Um, yeah, so 
Um, did the report ha- actually happen to answer <laughs> this question? This is a very good question. It doesn't sound like it. No, it didn't. And, you know, it's, but there are some interesting things about it, which is that, first of all, unlike in ages past, uh, and by ages past, I mean 2013, which, let's face it, in computer, you know, cybersecurity world is ages past, um, uh, phishing dominates. Uh, and then after phishing, you know, uh, there's there's basically hacking malware and everything else as the attack patterns, um, though they are in reverse order for you know depending on which one you're looking at. Um, but you know, on a on a high level, the bad guys are still after money, and it's all about the credentials. Um, now, I think one of the one of the conclusions that that the DBIR authors come to, which I actually do agree with, is that they they say that the move to the cloud has in a sense leveled the playing field between large and small businesses. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, on the one hand, the capabilities that were once reserved for the largest of large businesses are now, you know, open for a relatively small price to mom and pop. However, that means that your problems that are that were once reserved for the largest of large businesses are now also problems for mom and pop with the cloud. Right. Um but they and don't I'm, have nearly the resources or, or sophistication. They do not. And I I do want to, you know, again, point out that that you cannot say that small businesses are less likely to be targeted using these numbers. That's just not that's not a conclusion that they draw. Yeah, please don't please don't do that. Um, <laughs> please don't go there. One thing that you can say though is that the differences in types and nature of attacks between large and small businesses, whereas they were once significant differences, those are starting to disappear. Those differences are disappearing and they're and they're coming new. Now there is a I think I think there's good news there, which because it means to me that that the techniques and technology that the big guys have been using, you know, are also useful by the for the small people. The, the small people, the smaller businesses, um, the little per, people, the little, yes, on, particularly as, <laughs> uh, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm a little person in this regard, right? I'm a so small, small boutique <laughs> firm. Um, and particularly as the costs come down. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, if you're really interested in this, I would recommend that you go back and it's chapter four, you know, they, they talk about it. Um, and like I said at the beginning, it was less interesting and also very interesting to me in this case, which is, um, but that's that's really all I want to say about the differences between um, large and small businesses. So for our final piece here, and again, apologies for the slightly longer episode, um, Kip, you heard a rumor about Sims. So mm-hmm. uh, what was that? Yeah, so SIM, right? So what this is, uh, just for people who aren't familiar with this acronym, uh, Security Information and Event Manager, it's a category or a class of tool. And what it does is it is it aggregates uh, event logs from different devices, very uh, disparate devices in some cases, and it uh, harmonizes those logs. And then it attempts to detect uh, patterns of things that you don't want to have going on in your environment, right? So attacks, uh, uh advanced persistent threats on your network, you know, snooping around trying to figure out, you know, how to launch an attack against you. Um, and so that's what that is. And so um, the, what I had heard is that they're only picking up about 1% of, of all attacks, which if that's true, then that makes this technology, which is very expensive to acquire and to operate, um, <laughs> it absolutely repudiates this entire uh, class of defense. So um, I think I get to surprise you a little bit. So, you know, I think it was, I'm not, exa- I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure where that rumor came from because when I went in and, and searched the entire DBIR for SIM and, and that concept, um, I did find something, but the number was not one percent. It was it was actually two and a half percent. Which oh my god, that's two and a half times. Like, it is. That's, that's a two hundred and fifty percent better performance. Okay, now <laughs> you're what just, I heard. Now you're just mocking, <laughs> mocking the, the. Okay, so um, oh, it's just so much fun with numbers, isn't that what this is, is all it about? Is. Um, but it was actually a reference to alerts involving exploitation of a vulnerability. Mm. Um, so it's not. You know, it's. I think it's not this, a full answer. It's not a full answer, um, and it's still actually pretty interesting. And you know, so here's the thing: if you talk to security engineers and IT guys, turn security engineers, 
you're going to hear them talk a lot about patching and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we talk to our customers about that a lot. We do. But I bet you're thinking, hmm, I bet the actual attacks involving those things aren't nearly as common, are they? And are they? You would be <laughs> you would be correct. But again, it's a bit nuanced. So first thing is to understand that the DBIR talks about survivorship bias. And it's important. Um and basically what it means is if you spend a lot of time looking at malware logs that didn't kill you, in other words, they didn't beat your security, you you probably are going to tend to overestimate the prevalence of that attack type. Um, and if you do that, you may underestimate what you should really be looking for. Ah, more psychological head games. All right, what are these guys really trying to get to? So, okay, so we're running out of time. But to boil it down, yes, vulnerability exploitation is quite rare. In fact, it hit its peak of just 5% back in 2017 and has been trending down since then as an attack variety. Um, uh, the rumor you heard about Sims was, was probably really about the low number of attacks involving exploitation of vulnerabilities. Um, but here's the key thing. Attackers are trying it anyway. And the DBIR team went a little deeper to figure things out. And basically, this is, this is important. Um, if you are good at patching, you are handling vulnerabilities pretty well. And if you are bad at patching, you are handing, handling those vulnerabilities pretty well. Mind-blowing, isn't it? <laughs> okay, well, there's some logic there. Yep, I yep. could see that. That's good. But the, um, but, but the key here is that the research shows that you cannot stop patching, right? You cannot stop patching. What they did is they wanted to look at servers. You know, there, there were some questions being asked like, you know, is it true that the internet gets more vulnerable and more dangerous with every vulnerability that's exposed? Um, and the fact is that it, it actually doesn't because what, what tends to happen is that servers that are vulnerable to a, a vulnerability, a new vulnerability tended to be vulnerable to vulnerabilities from 10 years ago. In other words, in other words, unpatched servers are unpatched servers and patched servers are patched servers. Um, okay. So this kind of makes the argument that just because you missed one patch, you're not as vulnerable as you may, as you may think you are, um, because the servers that tend to get exploited are the ones that just are never patched at all. Is exactly. That-, that that is part of it. And I think and you know, it, the 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 key takeaway here also gives me an opportunity to use what I think is the best sentence in the entire DBIR. <laughs> it's um, really good. <laughs> yes, and here it is. There is no outrunning the bear in this case because the bears are all being 3D printed in bulk and automated to hunt you. <laughs> right, and that's a, that's a takeoff of the old joke about, you know, if a bear uh, attacks you in the woods, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun your buddy. <laughs> right. And uh but exactly. Except that you don't, right? In this case, right. you can't get complacent because the bad guys aren't breaking a sweat testing for easy vulnerabilities. If you become lax, you will get owned. Uh, oh, yeah. Or pwned. So, yeah. You know, I, it's it's a really good reminder uh, of what this is all about and the differences between uh, perception and reality when it comes to the automated nature of of you know cybersecurity attacks, which is yeah. you know again those bears are being three D printed in bulk and like little toy soldiers, they're just being sent out to hunt. Um, it does not cost anything to do that for the bad guys, and it really doesn't take them much time and effort. So, and it's a really striking contrast to the vision that, uh, or the image that Hollywood puts out to us, right? Ever, going all the way back to War Games, that movie with Matthew Broderick uh, that came out in uh, 1983, and it depicted um, hackers as just these bored teenagers. Uh, who just were, you know, futzing around on their keyboards and never really mean to harm anybody, but sometimes go oops and, you know, do something that didn't mean to cause some trouble. We all, cl- you know, we clean it up, slap them on the wrist and we get going again. And and you would think that, that the depiction of the threat would be sort of updated for the times. It's not. I mean, Mr. Robot is a fantastic show that came out of uh, Hollywood and uh, and yet it still depicts while ra- while very authentic uh, hacking, it still depicts the the threat as a as a loner, as somebody who is uh, socially maladjusted and so on. And so we just don't have a popular media image of what's really happening today, which is this this automated um, hacking, the you know, the printing of these. Th- <laughs> 
<laughs> the 3D printing of these bears. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and they just swarm and swarm and swarm constantly. Uh, they're ravaging, they're locusts, they're eating everything. It's such a different reality from, from what we're being led to believe. Okay, uh, I could go on, I could talk about that for a long time, but let's wrap up the episode. And just a recap, how should you use the DBIR? All right, once you understand your industry in depth and you you know, you know, kind of get uh, the overall sense for what happened last year, you're definitely going to want to reference these statistics in your budget requests. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about budget uh, time, right? You should, you should be, by the time you're listening to this, you should be preparing your proposals for your 2021 budget and use this information. Uh, if necessary, you know, borrow their charts and graphs. I mean, they have really least high resolution versions of them free for you to use. Don't just, you know, do, you know, cruddy little screenshots. Just take a moment and go out and get the actual high resolution ones and use those. Um, Make sure that you're looking at geography as well as industry. Put those two things together so that you are well-founded in what's actually going on in your area of the world and the industry that you're working in. And anytime somebody criticizes you about, you know, the 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 spend, your budget, um, what you're choosing to you know to focus on in terms of threats, whip that report out, keep it keep it handy, and you know be ready to cite your sources and uh, and provide the data to justify what you're doing to people who just want your budget for other things that they think is going to make the world a better place. And I can't wait for next year's report because. COVID-19 disruption is real and it is disturbing our patterns and the attackers' patterns. The amount of criminal activity and cyber attacking that the adversary is engaged in right now is super high. Super high. And yeah, it's and I think next year the report is going to be very different. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh and in a total disruption. Uh, caused by COVID-19, we're going to switch. I'm going to say, well, that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management (laughs) Podcast. Today, we did part two of our analysis of the 2020 edition of the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report to see what we could learn. So we'll see you next time. And uh, sorry for being so chatty. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport, so include your senior decision makers, legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.